Welcome you to our website tonight, the study of the book of Hebrews, commentary verse by verse, with questions at the end of every chapter. Uh, we're uh, very glad to have you as you tune in, and uh, we hope you have an open Bible that you can study along with us in your living room, and also that you have open minds and open hearts most of all. And if there's anything that I teach that's not in the Bible, uh, write in and tell us. And uh, sound off and let us know and test the Scriptures and test your preacher by the Scriptures and make certain that what he says is of the Word of God. Uh, we're in uh, chapter 2. Uh, this is, uh, we have uh, nine weeks to go. we we'll try to do all thir 13 chapters in the next nine weeks. We're in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to combine chapter 3 and 4 next week because they're small tra chapters. Uh, chapter 2 is a book of comparisons. Uh, it compares the old and the new, the angels in Christ. And uh, the argument is what we call in law ad fratori. Ad fratori means from the, uh, uh, from the least to the greatest. And when you argue from the least to the greatest, the greatest is always greater than the least. And that's what Paul's going to do here, being a, a skilled logician and a skilled legal mind, and his mind being inspired of the Holy Spirit, uh, he was able to make great comparisons and with crystal clear thought communicate like no other theologian can communicate today. So it's up to me to take what Paul communicated and then to communicate it to you tonight. Uh, those of you here at uh, James Madison University in the classroom have an overhead, and you can see the comparisons between the word of angels and the word of Christ. And uh, he says in chapter 2, For this reason we must pay much closer attention. In order to pay attention takes mental energy. And we're living in a psychedelic age. Uh, the devil has made psychedelic idiots out of us. Uh, the devil wants you to just flash things on, flash things on, and uh, give you just little bits and starts and bursts. Uh, there's no long-term thinking. And if you're going to be a successful person, you've got to learn to think on a long term. You've got to think with processes. And when Paul said you've got to pay much closer attention, uh, he's saying, I want your mind. Uh, I want you to give me your concentration. And that takes energy. It takes physical, emotional, and mental energy to think. So no one should come to the Word of God without that poise and that attitude of mind. Uh, it says here uh, that you ought to pay much closer attention to what you've heard. Uh, that means you've heard the gospel. The gospel's in all the world. The Holy Spirit has made sure that the gospel has gone from Africa all the way up to the Arctic Circle. The gospel has gone from California all the way to China. Uh, the gospel's everywhere. No one can get away from it. Whether they believe it or not makes no difference. You may be listening to me tonight and you don't believe the gospel. But you do uh, have access to it. It has been heard. It's not God's fault. It's your fault. God has got the gospel into all the world. And He said you need to pay closer attention to what you've heard, lest it drift away. Now, this word drift away is a picture of a boat. And that boat, you tied it up, but you didn't tie it securely enough. And uh, the waves started coming in, and the wind started blowing, and you didn't notice it. It started drifting away. And that's what can happen to your soul. That's what can happen to your salvation in Christ. That's what can happen to your spiritual quest of eternal life. You can start losing it. You can start drifting away. You don't know it's drifting. You start giving yourself to other attention. You, you start giving yourself to other idols and other gods. And the gods of the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And you start becoming less a man, less a woman than you used to be. And it starts drifting away. And before long, you wake up one day and you look out on the harvest, uh, out on the harbor, and you see your boat is so far away from shore, you can't get it. God forbid that that should happen to anybody listening to me tonight. That that boat drifts so far away that it's out of sight and it can happen. Paul would never have said it if it couldn't have happened. Now he said, if the word spoken through angels proved unadulterable, that means that no one could uh, uh, alter the word that God spoke. Now when you go back to the book of Genesis chapter 12, it says that God, in chapter 20, chapter 22, God said, I am the Lord your God. Hear the word of the Lord. 
God spoke, but God spoke through angels. These angels became mediators between God. And if you go back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32, you're going to find out how that God spoke in the Old Testament. And in Deuteronomy 32, they came to the Mount Sinai, and there Moses and the elders looked up at that great mountain that overshadowed the people of God. And God looked down from that mountain, and that mountain lit up like an electrical storm. That mountain lit up like a volcano. That mountain lit up like a, 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 a Christmas tree, and it flashed on, and it flashed off. And the people were terrified. And in Deuteronomy 33, the people, if they touched that mountain, they were put to death. If even a beast touched that mountain, he died. And so God made a spectacular appearance on that occasion. It says the Lord came from Sinai. He dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand there was flashing lightning. Now this is God giving the law. A little later on, Paul goes into more detail about the giving of the law from the mount. And uh, he talks about how that they looked up and they saw across the expanse of the heaven a great foundation. And on that foundation, they saw the body of Jesus Christ. Yes, they, in the Old Testament, they saw the body of Jesus Christ superseding and presiding and superimposing upon that fiery mountain. So when they saw the fiery mountain, they saw the law. And when they looked up, they saw the body of Christ. It was a prophecy, a figure of the fact that someday God would send His Son to destroy the law of Moses and to establish the law of the Spirit, the law of grace. A fantastic appearance. But angels were everywhere. Thousands of angels, Psalm 68, verse 17. He looked up and saw thousands. I've said many times there are more angels than there is a national debt in the United States of America. There are trillions of angels. And they were the mediators through which God gave the law. When Stephen preached in Acts chapter 7, verse 53, I take that back. Uh, the first martyr, Stephen, yes, uh, he told the Jews that the law was ordained by angels. And, uh, and uh, Paul told the Galatians in Galatians 3.19 that the law was not God's intended purpose. It was not something that God had in a long-range process. It was a short-term thing because it was added because of transgressions, because of the hardness of their hearts. They had to have a law to stop them. Brothers and sisters, you should not have a law to stop you. You should have nothing but the Spirit of God and the love of Christ to make you live right. You shouldn't have to have a law to punish you every time you do something wrong. Because we're now under the law of the Holy Spirit, which is a far greater law than the law of Moses. Therefore, the word of Christ, he says, If the word spoken through angels proved unadulterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense. If you despise the law of Moses, if you transgress the law of Moses, you were punished immediately. Is that the way God works today? No. <laughs> Paul said, do you despise God because of His long suffering? You say, I sinned and I got away with it. <laughs> I sinned and I'm not dead yet. <laughs> you see? Oh, brothers and sisters, if you only knew, you're not getting away with that sin. But the Bible says that God is treasuring it up unto the day of wrath. And when it's going to be poured out upon you, you're going to find out that that sin you did that you thought you got away with is going to come back with more vengeance and fury than you could ever imagine when you stand before God in the next world. Therefore, it says that God is also going to hold people accountable in an even greater degree if they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. For he said it's more important 
than the law of Moses. Now we come down here to verse 3 in your Bibles, brothers and sisters. How shall we escape if we neglect it? Now this is a great salvation. It's called a mega salvation. It says in Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. When they wanted to find out what dynamite was, they didn't know. They didn't know what to call it. And so they went to the Bible and they found this word dunamis. They said the gospel is dunamis, power. <laughs> and so they called it dynamite, <laughs> the most powerful thing in the world, brothers and sisters. It will blow this world away. It's the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is power. And he says that you better listen to it. He said it is a great mega salvation. He said after it was at, at the first spoken through the Lord. Now the gospel began with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Not angels. Ten billion angels could not do what one Jesus could do. Ten billion angels gave the laws. One Jesus gave the gospel. Now what should you listen to? Should you listen to the law of angels? Or should you listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ? There's a guy that said he had a vision from an angel called Moron. And that angel came down from heaven and appeared to him. Well, I want to tell you, I'd rather listen to Jesus than an angel called Moron, wouldn't you? Another guy over in a cave in Arabia said that he had a visit from a genie. And he called the genie, he called him Gabriel. At first he thought it was a demon. Well, it was a demon. But his family talked him out of it and said it wasn't a, a demon. It was the angel Gabriel. I want to tell you I wouldn't trade the gospel of Jesus Christ for a billion sermons from the angel Gabriel. Paul said if I preach to you, or if an angel from heaven preach to you, any other gospel than what you've heard, then let him be accursed. So I'm telling you that right now, we're looking at that which was first spoken through the Lord, and it was confirmed. Now get that. Say that word, confirmed, with me. It was confirmed unto us by those who heard him. Now how do you confirm something? In order to confirm something, you've got to establish it and make it authentic. You've got to make it credible. So just preaching it wasn't enough. God said, what I'm going to do is give some additional confirmational authenticity so that you'll have no doubt in your mind but what this is from God. And then in verse 4, he tells us what those confirmation authenticating things were. He said, God bore witness with them both by signs. Now, signs are miracles that you can see. You look, and you say, wow, I'm telling you something happened back in those days. Did you know that not one person, whether a skeptic or an atheist, denied the fact that miracles were worked in the first century? No one could deny it. Even the worst critics of Jesus, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, said, we can't deny the miracles that are being worked. And uh, uh, something happened. I mean, you don't have Christmas. You don't have Easter. You don't have A.D. and B.C. for nothing. This is not called the, tier, the year 2010 after Caesar. <laughs> this isn't called the year 2010 uh, after some pharaoh down in Egypt. Those guys are dead and gone. But we call it 2010 A.D. after the dominion of Jesus Christ. Caesar's gone. Pharaoh's gone. Christ is still here. Something happened. I'm telling you, something happened. And here we have in verse 4 what did happen. No one could dispute that the whole Roman world was turned upside down. Even Rome was shaken. Why? Claudius Caesar, Nero, was so shook up, he committed suicide. I mean, the gospel back in that day was so credible, it either drove you to your knees or it drove you mad. 
They said they're turning the whole world upside down. And I'll tell you why. I'm going to go back here and read from the book of uh, Mark for you, brothers and sisters, and uh, the 16th chapter of Mark. And it says there that they went into the whole world and they preached the gospel, uh, and they only had from 30 uh, A.D. to 70 A.D. to do it. They had to do it before 70 A.D. Anybody who knows anything about 70 A.D., if you don't know anything about 70 A.D., you don't know anything about the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew 24, He said the temple's going to be destroyed. He said, look at the stones on that temple. I'm telling you that not one stone will be left upon the other. That was a prophecy. Now, when Jesus said there's not going to be one left, stone left upon the other, do you think that there's going to come a day when there will not be one stone left upon the other? Huh? Is there a temple over there today in Jerusalem? The mosque of Omar is over there. There's some synagogues over there. There's no temple over there. Whatever happened to that temple? I'm going to tell you something. The destruction of that temple was divine intervention from God because He said the law of Moses has got to go because we're not going to have the gospel of Jesus Christ and the law of Moses on the same continent. <laughs> and the gospel of Jesus Christ stuck around and the law of Moses went when the temple went. It went. It's God. So he said the gospel is going to be preached in all the world. They had from 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. to get the job done. I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, did they get the job done? If Jesus told them to go, what did they do? They went. <laughs> you know, sometimes we stay when they go. Sometimes we stay around too much. I don't know how in the world a Christian can be a Christian and not go out and tell people about it. I don't know how you can keep it silent. You're like the rivers in Virginia this last winter. You're frozen at the mouth. Now listen to me. In the 16th chapter, he said, in verse 16, you go, he that believes and is immersed shall be saved, but the one who disbelieves shall be condemned, and these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new languages. They'll pick up serpents. They'll drink deadly poison. If it, uh, it, it shall not hurt them, they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll, not, and they'll recover. The guy asked me if I could heal the sick. I said, I can do better than that. I can get people saved. What would you better do? Have a well body and a sick mind or would you rather have a well mind and a sick body? Some people want to get their bodies healed and their minds are so sick they need salvation. Greatest revival in the world is when you get soul saved. And when you get your soul saved, you're not going to be focusing all the time on your aches and pains and Buddhism and rheumatism. He said, can you speak in languages? I said, I can't even speak English very good. I ain't got much education. <laughs> he said, well, you're not a very good preacher. I said, well, how about you? I said, he was my barber, by the way. He was my barber. He was really picking on me. He was really picking on me. Wanted to know if I could do miracles. And I said, well, can you do miracles? He said, yeah. He told me about all the miracles he could do. I said, all right. I said, over in verse 18, I said, now, uh, I, I, I got a guy that's got a zoo. He's got a big fat cobra over there, and I'm going to go get him. I want you to go over there and prove to me that you're a child of God. I want you to go over there and pet that cobra right on, the, right on his head. He said, oh, oh, no. He said, well, that, that, that had to be testing God. I said, well, that's what he said. You've got to test God. These apostles had to test God. Why were these signs given? They were given to credulize and test. They had to prove that these apostles were from God. Paul got bit by a viper. It didn't kill him. It proved to them that he was an apostle from God. I don't have to prove that. I got the Word of God. My credulization is based upon my knowledge of the Word of God, right? Do you want your preacher to know the Word of God, or do you want him to bring a big rattlesnake in here? What do you want? <laughs> but they had to have rattlesnakes. 
And then I said, well, we got some arsenic and ammonia and cyanide down here at the, at the CVS drugstore. I'll go down and mix some up. I want to see you drink it. And then you tell me if you can work miracles. If you don't die, you're a miracle worker. He said, ah, oh, I'd be testing God. I said, I'm telling you, brother, that's how we know if you're an apostle, if you can drink, if you drank poison, you didn't die. I said, the very argument that you're using is proving you wrong. He told me, he said, your haircut is almost finished. And I'm glad it wasn't a razor cut. I'm glad. I mean, look, I don't mean to be sassy and mean and cantankerous, but I want to tell you, I believe that my apostles established this New Testament and that they credulized it by miracles and signs. And it says here, that it was confirmed unto who? In verse 4. Uh, it was confirmed in verse 3. Unto who? Unto who? Us. Say that. Us, right. Do I have to confirm something? It's already been confirmed. Huh? Once it's confirmed, it need never be confirmed again. Did you know that? Legally, in a court of law, once something's confirmed, it need never be confirmed again. And 2,000 years ago, brothers and sisters, this New Testament was confirmed by signs. Now, miracles are that which transcends human understanding. Walking on water, raising the dead, feeding 5,000 people from loaves and fishes, gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Now, you say, well, do you believe we have the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes, and do. I do believe. In fact, I believe we have more of the Holy Spirit in us when we don't expect signs, when we do, then when we do expect signs, because they're just a fine line between the spirit of the devil who wants you to prove stuff all the time and the spirit of Christ who takes everything that God says as foolproof. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. It says in the, in, in the book of Acts chapter 2.22 that Jesus, His ministry was confirmed by great signs and wonders, and Peter said, to this day, you know, you've seen it. You've seen the miracles and signs and wonders that confirmed His ministry. In John 3, verse 34, it said Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. He had the Holy Spirit without what? Without what? Without measure. Is there anybody here that has the Holy Spirit without measure? Huh? We, I tell you what, some of us just, we might not even have a microscopic little fraction of an inch of the Holy Spirit in us. Some of us have more of the Holy Spirit in us because we have the Holy Spirit with measure. Are you with me? You see that? Look, if you read your Bible more, pray more, witness more, if you have a fellowship with God more than I do, uh, you're going to have more of God's Holy Spirit in you than I do. And Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead, bodily and in every way. He filled everything. He was full. But notice here in 1 Corinthians twelve twenty seven. It says, first of all, he gave apostles, he gave prophets, and he gave gifts, tongues, miracles, signs. He gave those things in 1 Corinthians 12. But in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, prophecy is going to cease. Tongues are going to fail. They're going to pass away. So, all of those things that were extraordinary powers that were given to the apostles, we're going to pass away. But the Holy Spirit is still there. The difference is, in Romans chapter 12, you take a look at Romans 12. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, they're all extraordinary supernatural gifts. But you look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, you're going to see a difference in Romans 12, verse 3. Uh, look at these gifts. Now, these are gifts to the Roman Christians. They all come from the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say every, every Christian is a gifted person. Don't say you don't have a gift. You do have a gift. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have a gift. And Romans chapter 12, uh, here's what he has to say, my brothers, my sisters, my courteous brethren. Listen to me. Through the gift given to me, I say to every man among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. But to, to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has a, allowed it to each a measure of faith. So you all have faith. You all have faith. For just as we have many members, uh, not all members do the same function, so uh, those of us who are many are one body, 
Individually, we're all members one of the other. We have different gifts. And then he goes on to say, let each exercise them accordingly. Prophecy. Now, prophecy could be a supernatural gift to foretell in the future. A prophet could tell you who's going to be the president of the United States next year. I mean, in the next uh, term. Uh, a prophet could tell you who, uh, where China's going to be at, where Russia's going to be at. Uh, a prophet could foretell the future and, and accurately predict it, and it would come to pass. But then, uh, 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 Revelation 19 said, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So, prophecy is not only foretelling, it's foretelling. Actually, I'm foretelling right now. I'm exercising a gift. I'm not a prophet. But I'm exercising a prophetic gift, which means I'm telling you what's happening and what has happened and what will happen, but I'm not supernaturally telling you detailed things that are going to happen in your life like a prophet could. So I have that gift. There's a lot of people who have that gift, but not everybody has that gift. And then he goes on to say this next. Uh, He says, uh, uh, service, verse 7, anyone can serve. It's a gift. Teach, that's a gift. Exhort, verse 8, that's a gift. Giving. Uh, what would we do without those uh, who give of their gifts to Melchizedek? Uh, give of their tithe and offering. That's what keeps the kingdom of God uh, surviving. That's what keeps the word of God uh, going. Gift. And you have, uh, uh, you've received income from God, then uh, let him uh, show his mercy by giving his gift back to God. And do it liberally. Don't be a, 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 sten, a skin flint, uh, stingy with your gift. Uh, you lead with diligence. Uh, that means you have uh, elders, uh, you have pastors, you have deacons. Uh, mercy, cheerfulness. None of those gifts are extraordinary. In fact, there's a lot of people in the world who have those gifts who, who don't even have the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit certainly is going to cultivate that gift in your life. Are you with me? So I have a diagram here of a happy man. I have the Father and the Son at the top. It says in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, verse 23 through 26, that the Spirit of God came from the Father. The Spirit of God also came from the Son. I don't know if you know anything about church history. Church history is a very hard subject. In fact, next to the apocalyptic studies and Greek I'd say that church history is probably the hardest discipline there is for any theologian to learn. But when I studied church history, I got into the difference between the Roman and the Greek, the Western and the Eastern uh, churches. And uh, the Romans said that the Holy Spirit came from Jesus Christ, and they would quote Scripture. But the Greek Orthodox said, no, no, the Holy Spirit came from God the Father. And they had a big war over that. In fact, they split over that. Can you imagine splitting over that? You say the Holy Spirit came from God the Father. I say the Holy Spirit came from Christ the Son. And so we split over that. That's what they split over. Two major Western and Eastern churches split over that stupid thing. But if you look at the Scriptures, you'll find out it was an unnecessary split. (laughs) There was no rhyme and there was no reason to do split. Because in verse 23 through 26 of uh, John 14, it says here, uh, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, uh, he'll keep my word and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode. In other words, if you are a child of Christ, you have God the Father in you, you have God the Son in you, and you have God the Holy Spirit in you. He said, we're all going to come. And then he goes on here. Uh, In verse 26, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you. So uh, the Father sent the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, okay? (laughs) So God the Father did send the Holy Spirit, okay? The Greek Orthodox, they said, well, that's the only answer you got. But if you come down here a little bit further... Uh, in John 15:26, he said, When the Helper comes, in verse 26, Whom I will send to you <laughs> from the Father. So they're both right. <laughs> Isn't that awful when you split when you're both right? Isn't that awful when you fight over something and you're both right? Sounds like a marriage to me. <laughs> now, when God the Father and God the Son sent the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> it was for salvation and adoption. 
But now the Holy Spirit also does some stuff. What He does is He gives gifts. So the happy man has the gift from God the Father and God the Son, the Holy Spirit. Then when the Holy Spirit comes into you, He gives you a gift, and then He gives you fruit, love and joy and peace and long-suffering, and gentleness, and goodness, and mercy, and a whole lot of long-suffering, and temperance. You know, that's from the Holy Spirit. See, He's in you giving you stuff. God gave you Him, and He gives you something. Can't beat that, can you? Huh? That one will sell, won't it? Do I have any bids on that one? <laughs> that one will sell, okay? All right. You're, 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 are you having fun tonight? Are you having fun in the Word of God? Ain't this fun, huh? Amen? Yeah? Has God been good to you? Has He been good to you? Huh? Has He hurt you? Anybody got hurt by the Lord yet? I got whipped by Him a couple of days ago. But He loves me. How many of you used to smoke a little bit and you got saved you don't smoke anymore? Anybody here used to smoke? Got saved, don't smoke anymore? Oh, you guys never did smoke. Okay, we got one guy. He got he don't smoke anymore. That's good. One guy I knew, he smoked. Smoked all of his life. And he died. He's still smoking. Okay. Now. <laughs> okay. I better quit that. You guys, don't turn off that thing right now. Okay. All right, number two. How many of you used to drink? You got saved. You threw away all that alcohol. Okay, praise God for that. That's great. All right, that's good. How many of you used to gossip a whole lot, huh? And you're still gossiping. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. Okay, we're down. All right, okay. Now, here's what. <laughs> all right, I love you. I wouldn't go so hard on you if I didn't love you, right? Okay. Now, so we have here uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 2 that, that the Son of God came to this world to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why He came. And these, these angels, they recognized Him. In Luke 2 verse 11, when He was born, the angels sang glory to God in the highest. And Matthew 28, verse 6, when he resurrected from the dead, angels were there, and they rolled away the stone, and they said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Go tell his brethren that he's risen, that he's not here. And they went into the tomb, and it was empty, and they ran as fast as they could. Those women spread the gospel far and wide because the angels told them about the risen Jesus. Even spirits, demons, and Luke, Chapter 8, verse 2, there was a man possessed with legions of demons. In fact, uh, uh, the demons were legion. That meant that there were a thousand demons in the guy. You say, man, that's a lot of demons. But that was before 2010. There's people today watching television and getting into the computer and fooling around with stuff they ought not fool with got more demons than that in them. I tell you what, there's more demons today than there ever was in history infestrating people. Total demon possession. I mean, there's more drugs available today than, 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 than were available at that time. More drugs to try to fight off demon infection. I'm not saying everything's wrong with drugs, no sir. Don't put me down in that category. But I'm telling you, a lot of people are on drugs right now. And they're worshiping demons, and they are just as hooked on drugs as this gathering maniac was hooked on demons. They can't quit. They're bound, shackled, hand and foot. Pornography, alcohol, drugs, illicit sex, intemperance, anger. They can't get over it. Demons are having a field day. But when Jesus came along, I want to tell you, those demons says, Ha! Huh, don't torment us! Don't torment us! You're not preaching the gospel if you don't torment demons. All the demons want you to do is just don't say anything. And we got preachers today that are so timid, they won't say a thing against the devil. We don't even know what sin is. And that's exactly where the devil wants the preacher. 
He wants them to tickle their ears and play footsies and feed lollipops to the people because the devil doesn't want to be tormented by telling the truth. It's one thing the devil hates. He hates it. Don't torment us! <laughs> the gospel torments demons. You're going to see revival in the church of Jesus Christ. You're going to see people come and fall for it. You're going to see people liberated. You're going to see people getting set free when the gospel is free. You're going to see people liberated. You know what freedom is? Freedom is when you do what you choose to do. You know what bondage is? Bondage is when you do things you don't choose to do. The devil is as happy as he can be when he's got you doing a lot of things you just don't want to do, but you just can't help yourself in that bondage. You can call yourself a free American. You can say, I'm the freest person on the face of this earth. But if you're in bondage to sin, you are the biggest slave in the universe. I don't care what sin it is. Both the spirits of God and the spirits of the devil know who Jesus Christ is. And they flee. You hear the old devil roaring like a lion, buddy? He don't like this kind of stuff. They flee. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Philippians 2, verse, chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, it says that everything in heaven is going to bow down. Now, these are angelic spirits, but they're given what they're called anthropomorphism. Say that word with me, anthropomorphism. And so the spirits are given human attributes, and it says they're going to bow their knee. The cherubim, the seraphim, when Christ comes, every knee in heaven is going to bow. When Christ comes, every knee on earth is going to bow. Some are going to do it willingly. Others are going to do it in great fear. They're going to cry to the mountains to hide them from the wrath of God and the Lamb. And then it says every knee in hell is going to bow. Every spirit that, that has ever gone there, every human being that has ever gone there, the devil himself and all of his legions are going to bow down and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the living God. And the whole universe is going to resound with that great expression of faith in Jesus Christ. And I'd much rather bow my knee now than bow my knee then. How about you? Woo! James 2.19 says that demons believe and tremble. So we're seeing a comparison between the demons and the spirits and the angels in Christ. In the Old Testament, angels were prominent in government. In Daniel 10, Daniel looked up and said, God save my country. Uh, every person ought to pray that God will save their country. I've been weeping and praying more for the United States of America in the last couple of months than I ever have in my life. I believe that right now more people are praying for the American people, more praying for this country than ever in the history of America. Right now, I believe it. It's the only thing keeping us going. We're a country that's trying to come apart. We're a country that's trying to slip down into sheol hell. And the only thing that's keeping us going right now is prayer. It's not the White House. It's not, uh, it's not the, uh, the Gulf uh, House. <laughs> it, 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 it's not the, uh, the, 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 the local authorities, the magistrates, the mayor, the senators, the congressmen. What's keeping America afloat right now? The prayers that are coming up before the Almighty God through the name of Jesus Christ. That's what's keeping us going right now. Been keeping us going for the last 20 years but more so now. And Daniel prayed, and he said his prayer went up before God. And God said to Gabriel, go down there and answer that prayer. So Gabriel took off. And you can read this in Daniel 10. I'm not embellishing it. I'm not making it up. This is exactly what happened. So, when he took off, Daniel said, I want prayer answered right now. Daniel liked to have his prayers answered right now. 
I do too. But his prayer wasn't answered. One day it wasn't answered. Two days it wasn't answered. Three days it wasn't answered. I like to have a timetable on my prayers. I like to see them answered. Ten days went by. Daniel said, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat anything. I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay here and die. If God don't answer my prayer, I just soon die. <laughs> Twenty-one days went by. He hadn't eaten a thing. And he was in a faint. He was in a swoon. And Jesus Christ, in a pre-incarnate condition, came. He's the one that looked like the Son of Man. It said he came down and put his hand on him, and Daniel looked up into the face of Jesus, and he trembled, and he fell down like a dead man. Jesus reached down and said, Get up, dearly beloved. Get up, he said, God loves you. Man, he said, God loves you. How would you like for an angel to come down or for someone to come down and tell you that God loves you? Wouldn't, wouldn't that make you happy? If someone told you that God loves you? You know, when I was in high school, they were always falling in love with somebody. Somebody was always falling in love with somebody. Everybody getting an engagement ring just about every other week or so. Uh, they'd do a big one steady with somebody all the time, you know. And they'd come over and they'd say, I think John likes you. He's been talking about you lately. He likes you. Oh, he does. John likes me, you know. Yeah. It was, it, somebody likes you, it cheers you up, you know. But can you imagine a supernatural person coming down from heaven and looking at you and saying, God likes you? He's been talking about you up in heaven. I know Job. I know you. I like you. Wouldn't that be great? God likes me. I don't care what you think of me. God likes me. Woo! I can live another day. I don't care if I'm starving to death. I don't care if i got money in the bank, Frank. I don't care whether you like me or not. God likes me. Wow! And so Daniel got up and he said, yeah, but my prayers aren't answered. <laughs> and then Gabriel come on the scene. Jesus was there first, and then Gabriel comes in, and Gabriel says, hold on. He said, I, I, I'm the culprit. I was sent by God to answer your prayer 21 days ago. And he said, I got waylaid. They, they sent the whole flank down there to tackle me down on the five-yard line, you know. <laughs> He ganged up on me. He said, the prince of Persia. Now, prince of Persia was all those demons that were in control of the country. And they just waylaid that Gabriel couldn't get through. He said, I'm trying to get through. He said, I couldn't get through. 21 days. He said, 21 days later, I said, hey, Mark, I need some help. Call on Michael the archangel. <laughs> you don't want to fool with Michael the archangel. Uh-uh. No, sir, you don't want to fool with him. Man, he's been lifting weights for the last 20 years. I'll tell you, that guy knows what... You don't want to fool with him, no how. And Michael bailed him out. He said, I'm finally here at last. And old Daniel got up and he says, Well, tell me now, what's going to happen next? And then they filled him in on the whole destiny of his people. The whole future was spelled out. And you can read it in the book of Daniel, chapter 10 and chapter 11, chapter 12. The whole future was spelled out. Because God knows the future before it even comes. So what we're looking at here is angels were very prominent in that government. But they, they, but they had a king over them. And as I mentioned, Gabriel was under Jesus. Michael was under Jesus. And the angels are still uh, uh, over the natural elements. In Revelation 9-11 it says the angels can control uh, uh, cyclones and hurricanes and uh, tidal waves and uh, uh, winter and summer, they're all under uh, angelic control. God uses them. The angels are before the throne of God in behalf uh, of innocent people, broken people. You wonder how you made it through life. My dad was a gambler. We just barely made it through life. I was embarrassed. I had to, I had to get food, food stamps when I went to school. My dad used to give me change to get a lunch, and it wasn't enough to even cover my meal. I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you that God looked down with mercy on me. I had a lot of angels to help me through. Then I went to Bible college. I got a car. I started driving a car. I tell you, my angels had a fit. When I started driving a car, those angels had big, big problems with me. And to this day, I got scars in my body. I should have died at least ten times from automobile accidents. Then I got into prize fighting. I didn't realize what I was getting into. I mean, I couldn't have picked the worst sport in the world than that. Someone trying to take my head off, okay? And my angels were saying, why, this guy has a hard case. 
Uh, why don't you give us a little bit better assignment than that, you know? And he's angels watching over Chuck Downey. That's a full-time job, you know? If I dropped dead on the spot right now, I'd have an angel grab me as quick as he can and body hang me and throw me up into heaven and say, my job's finally done. Thank God he's in that. He's saved that. I mean, angels take care. They're still working. But one thing an angel has never seen in the Old Testament, he's never seen a Spirit-filled child of God. Because it says in John that the Spirit of God had never been given to, uh, yet to indwell completely. A, 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 a. In other words, uh, Jesus said the Spirit had not yet come in a way to fill us. And to bring the glory of God inside of us. And to bring sanctification to us. And so these angels had never... They don't know what it's like to see a spirit-filled man. Uh, in fact, the angels are so fascinated with people like you. If the Bible says it, that they desire to look in upon the things that we're looking in upon. I mean, uh, those angels are looking over my shoulder. Uh, they say, what are you going to say next, man? Well, we can't preach the gospel. We're spirits. We don't have tongues like you do. We don't have lips like you do. We're not redeemed like you. We don't have the Holy Spirit living in us like you. We are spirits, but we don't have the Holy Spirit in us. And they're saying, the angels are so interested, they wonder what you're going to do next. And if you're a child of God, I want to tell you, you make the angels so happy, they're saying to God, man, that program works. Man, that, that program works, God. We didn't know it work like that. We didn't, we didn't believe you could create a flesh and blood man that would be perfect like your son Jesus was. We didn't believe you could create flesh and blood men and women like are, are sitting there listening to you talk and are on that website right now uh, that, that could be filled with the Holy Spirit. We didn't believe you could do that. We've seen men and women at their worst. Jezebel. We saw David commit adultery even though he was a man after your own heart and try to kill a man. We've seen people like uh, uh, Baal and Ashtaroth and uh, the Philistines and, uh, uh, and the Canaanites and people worshiping idols. We, we've seen man in his worst. And now, in Ephesians 1, 6, why we're seeing people who are beloved of God. We're, we're seeing people who are beloved of the angels. We're seeing people there in chapter 2, verse 6 of the book of Ephesians. They're sitting in heavenly places. Those who were dead in their sins and trespasses as He raised up. And He has made them to sit in heavenly places. Whew. Look, sister. Brother. You're not sitting on those chairs. You're not sitting with your feet on the concrete. You're sitting in heavenly places. You say, well, my body's there. Yeah, your body's there. But you're not of this world, right? The Spirit of God is in you. Your affections are where the Spirit is, right? Say your affections on things above, not things of earth, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And where He is awaiting, He's coming that He might receive you. You have glory before you get glory. You have glory within. When Christ comes, you're going to have glory without. In Revelation 3.21, it says here that Christ is going to make you to sit with Him in His throne. Just as God allowed Jesus to sit with Him in His throne, if you overcome, you're going to sit with Jesus in His throne. What a reign that's going to be. It says that we are beloved of Christ. We are brethren to Christ. We are His brethren. Look at this. It says here, He did not subject angels to the world to come concerning which we are testifying. But one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that thou rememberest him? Or the son of man that thou art concerned about him? Thou hast made him for a little while lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor and has appointed him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in the subjection under his feet. You're going to say, wow! God wanted all things to be put under our feet. And God wanted us to have glory. 
that's what God gave Adam. When he gave Adam that, he said, Adam, all things are under your feet. The whole world's yours. All the works of my hands from the, the universe, past, present, and future, it's all yours. You're a little lower than the angels, but you have glory and honor. Now what happened, Adam? What happened? What happened to that glory and honor that he had? What happened to it? Why? Where's it at? What did Adam do? When he transgressed against God, he lost it all. It's lost. It's gone. It's not, it's not anywhere near. But before we take our break, which we're going to do in about two minutes, I want to put your thought in your mind. What Adam lost, the Son of God got back. What the first Adam lost, the second Adam got back. And Jesus was the king of the earth for three and a half years, right? He was a little lower than the angels too because he had a flesh body, right? Okay, he had a flesh body. Angels don't have flesh body. He was confined to space and time and matter and energy and force. But in that flesh body, he had power over death, over demons, over the domain, over disease. He had power over all. For three and a half years, he got it back. And now he's qualified. Jesus Christ, who got that glory back, is qualified to share that glory with you and me. And we have it within right now. Someday it's going to work its way out. But we have it within. I hope you have glory within you right now. Now we're going to take a little break. Eight, verse 5 through 7. And it's talking about the glory. Now David was a shepherd boy. And David would take, uh, no doubt, time away from his chores and uh, go out into the meadow and the pasture and uh, no doubt lay on his back and meditate and look up into the heavens and praise God. And uh, in these praise times, he would write this great book of Psalms with the accompaniment of his harp. O oh Lord, he says in Psalms chapter 8, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He looked up and see all the glory of God, the constellations and the Orion and the Pleiades and uh, uh, the, the uh, Milky Way. Uh, and uh, uh, he said, you've displayed your splendor uh, above the heavens. And verse 3, he said, I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you've ordained. He knew that everything ran, ran by law. Uh, he wasn't a, uh, uh, an evolutionist. Uh, he didn't believe that uh, the world came into existence uh, through random principles. But uh, he believed that everything was de designed and ordained by law. And, and in order to have natural law, you had to have a, a lawgiver. And he knew that lawgiver was the almighty Elohim God. But then he looked and he said, What is man that, 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 that you take uh, thought of him? Verse 4. Uh, as a teenage boy, uh, probably 18, I was headed for destruction. And it was Christmas. And I lived in a, a little town called Martins Ferry, Ohio, on the Ohio River. And uh, it was right across the river from Wheeling, uh, West Virginia. And as you look out over where I lived at, I lived on a, a, the elevation uh, on the Ohio side of the valley, the High River Valley, and I was one of the last houses on the top of the hill there. It just went straight up. Uh, my dad bought an old uh, uh, coal mine uh, office. It only had two rooms, and uh, he he put in a bathroom and uh, and uh, built on a bedroom, and that's where I was born at, and lived there to the day I went to college. Uh, and I look out over the uh, Ohio Valley, and I could see uh, the Ohio River, and Back in those days, they had the old uh, paddle wheel ships that would go up. Uh, the boats and the, the, the wheels would be turning and throwing another spray. 
Uh, and then they had the old steam engine. They'd be letting off their steam, and uh, you could hear them, uh, uh, the, the choo-choo trains going up and down uh, the valley. And, and it would just resound all through the valley. And it was Christmas, and everybody had their lights on. I love to see Christmas lights. It tells me about Jesus, the light of the world. And uh, I look over on the other side, the West Virginia side, and I see the old towers up there where uh, the lights were blinking on and off to warn the, uh, the aircraft. And then I look out, and it was dark, and all these lights were flashing on and off, and I listened to the steam engines and the boats and the Blonox company down there. Just, uh, once in a while they let off the whistle uh, when the, the, the workers would change shifts, and it was an excitement for me. And then I look up into the heavens and see the, the, the starry sky, just like David looked up there and saw the heavens. And I looked up there, and I, and I knew how big it was. I, later on, I, I studied a little bit of a... Uh, astronomy, and, and, and I found out uh, how, many, how many stars are up there that you can see with the naked eye, about 50,000, and then beyond the highest fired telescopes, just stars upon stars and moons and suns. And I believe it was all made there just for the planet Earth, uh, for the oxygen that we breathe, and uh, so that we could have a water and, and an atmosphere. I believe everything out there is interlocked just for the glory of God to be known by people on the planet Earth. That's what David's saying here. As big as it is, as vast as it is. I'm told that light which travels 168,000 miles a second or so, uh, it, 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 and, uh, it would go around the planet Earth five times in one second. And yet, uh, uh, light hasn't even reached uh, some of the stars that this solar system is so, I mean, the universe is so big. And David looked up there. And he said, who am I? What am I? And I felt the same way. I felt like a little blade of grass out in the middle of a football field. Who am I? And that led to me investigating who I was. And where I am today started right there. When I said to God, I don't know who you are. I know you're big and I know I'm little. But I said, God, I want you to make me the man you want me to be. That was my prayer. And I've been praying that prayer ever since. And that's exactly what David said. He says in verse 6 of Hebrews 2, he says uh, in Psalms 8, verse 4, What is man that you think about him? And the son of man that you do care for him. And then it says in verse 6, what is man that you are concerned about him? And the son of man. Now, man is me. The son of man is Jesus. And God sent the God-man that the God-man might exalt the man. Glory can only be found in the Son of God. There's no glory. You can search all over the world for glory. But you're never going to find it until the Son of God finds you. Man lost his glory. All that Adam had in the garden, he lost it. Noah had, uh, he was the king of the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. But Noah lost it all when he sinned. But Jesus got that glory back with a sinless life. And it says here that when we are born again of the water and of the Spirit, that God gives His Spirit to those who obey Him. And to those that obey Acts 2.38, God gives His Spirit, and God gives the forgiveness of sin. And the Spirit is sent. And that Spirit is all around us. But He wants to be in us. And the Spirit that is all around us comes in us when sin is washed away by the blood of Christ through obedience to the covenant of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Now, what God has given to us is the glory. In 1 Corinthians three twenty-one and 22, I, I, I'd read that to you, but somebody here who has a Bible, open your Bible and read it. I want you to read it for yourself. 1 Corinthians three twenty-one and 22, because it's, it's a verse that just knocks you out of your socks. It's a verse that sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, it's a verse that you wouldn't even expect to read in the Bible. But 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 22, who's got it for me? Please read it. 
so that I, I want you to read it for yourself. Read it to me. Anyone, right? Okay, we got one over here. Read it to us. Therefore, no, therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, now, just, just, just let that soak in for a little bit. You don't, don't know what he's saying right there? What has God given us in Christ Jesus? What has He given us? The whole universe. Everything's yours. Things past, present, future. Things that haven't happened yet. I, I don't know why we don't think of ourselves more the way that God thinks of us. Have you ever put yourself down as being a nobody? Have you ever said, well, I'm, not, I'm nothing, I'm not important? Look, little old you, little old me, as insignificant as we may be, all right, have been given by the King of the universe, the King of the earth, Jesus Christ, all things, past, present, Future, terrestrial things, celestial things, things that are invisible, things that even happen yet. Now, what he's saying is the angels think they're somebody, you know? But God thinks that you're somebody. That's what he's saying. I, I'm amazed at how Christians function far short of their capacity because all things belong to them. They are exalted in Christ, though they came from the dust. And that Christ wants us to have a better opinion of who we are. Now, I'm going to show you on the screen here God's plan of the great salvation by giving us a sure covenant word, by giving us sure redemption, forgiveness, by giving us a final confirmed word, by giving us a superior word, by exalting us, by glorifying us, by justifying us, by crowning us, by uh, 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 giving us the praise that we might praise Him, and fearlessness that we might be free, and true life that we can enjoy and that we can really live. Now, God couldn't give that in the Old Testament. God could not prove His justice. God could not prove His mercy. God could not harmonize His love and His law. He couldn't do that. And so everything that God wanted us to have, He couldn't give it to us. He crowned us with glory and honor. We lost it. He appointed us over the work of, the, of His hands. We lost it. You know, in this 21st century, we pride ourselves in technological advancement uh, and... Uh, uh, educational and industrial advancement and, and scientific and biological and every kind of advancement. But I want to tell you, we're a mess. We are an emotional, spiritual. We are a mess. We've never been in a worse condition than we are right now. Well, we think we've got it made, and, and yet we can't even govern ourselves. People are messed up more today than they've ever been in history, and yet we pride ourselves in our medicine. We pride ourselves in our technology. We, 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 we pride ourselves in our military hardware. But we're a mess because we're under a curse. We're under a curse of sin. We can't get along with each other. Homes are breaking up. Kids are wayward. Children are going mad. With all of these things that we have, I want to tell you, Adam could have had all of that. Everything that we have in America today, Adam could have had it in one day if he hadn't sinned. Because God gave him glory over all the earth. Are you following me? We're not so smart. Adam could have had everything that we've ever had in all of our economic and scientific advancement in the last 50 years. Adam could have had it in one day if he hadn't sinned. Are you with me? Because God gave him dominion over the whole earth. Kenny Hilton's an old fishing friend of mine. We were up in Canada fishing, and, and he brought out his tackle here and everything. And, and uh, 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 he said, uh, uh, how you fish? 
up here. And I said, Brother, I said, you're a Christian, aren't you? He said, yeah. I said, well, God gave you dominion over the whole world. Why should I have to tell you how to fish? <laughs> he said, come on now. Well, actually, I lied to him because we did. We lost it all. If, if, if I had Adam, if I hadn't have sinned, I'd have found out a way to catch those fish even without fishing tackle. I mean, God gave Adam everything he needed. Now I got a tackle box as big as his, and I still don't catch fish. I'm telling you. The time I go fishing, I got to learn a new trick. I'm going to have to get with Randy Trout one of these days and really catch some fish, you know. <laughs> now, but, but, but what we're saying here is that when Christ came, he was crowned with glory, he was king of the earth. The invisible king of the universe became the visible king of this earth. In Philippians 2, 8, and 9, uh, he wore the crown because he bore the cross. And that's what it's saying here. And it's saying here in verse 8, the understatement of the Bible. In verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now, so I say this with me, but now, we do not yet see all things subject to Him. Did you see that? Now, that's an understatement. <laughs> we don't see all things subject to man right now, do we? Do we? Man can't work things out. You know, everybody talks about how successful they are uh, and how great medicine is, but who has been able to stop us from dying? We're still dying, aren't we? They're all dead. All the atheists are dead. All the people who didn't believe in God are dead. All the people who were so great in the past are dead today. And the people who are great today are going to be dead in the future. We lost it all. We, we don't yet see all things subject to man. Now, the word see here in the Greek language means that we look around and, and, and we're, we're like zombies. We're walking around and a little bit like a teenager. You know, a teenager, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, cannot focus. Teenagers cannot focus. Uh, you know, they, they're... Uh, uh, they, and, 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 and they shake their hand and they say, How you doing? You know. They won't look in the eye. You know, but my dad always taught me and said, Look, he said, you want to be successful. He said, you've got to face people. You've got to take their hand. You've got to confront the issue. You've got to look him in the eye. But, but uh, uh, we don't see. We just don't see. You, you show me a teenager that can look you in the eye, a teenager that has focus, that can concentrate, and I'll show you a teenager that's going to be successful in anything they do. They've got to learn it early. Okay? Now, they're going to learn it earlier or later, but they're going to have to learn it. Focus, focus, focus. But the word see here, there's no focus to it. We look around, not, not, nothing's subject to man. Everything's going to crazy. Everything's confused. Everything's out of order. Everything's out of orbit. Where are you going? I don't know. Where are you headed? I don't know. Where'd you come from? I don't know. No, there's no direction. Life is not a process. It's like a whirlwind. It's like, it's like centrifugal forces. You're just, it's like a whirlpool. We're just going around in circles all the time. Man, if you're a child of God, you know where you're going. We don't see things subject to man anymore. Man doesn't know what he's doing, where he's going. You take a philosophy class. You take an ethics class. You go to a university and... Uh, they say, I want to learn truth. They say, what is truth? We don't know what truth is. You know, everything's relevant. But what about absolute? There are no absolutes. Is it a sin to commit adultery? Oh, sometimes maybe, sometimes not. We recommend it if you're having a problem with your wife. I mean, nothing's absolute. And so a kid goes through that, he goes through a, a maelstrom. He goes through school, he learns that stuff, he comes out, his head screwed on the wrong way. He doesn't know where he's going, you know. It's like the motorcycle guy. He, got, he, had, a, he had a wreck. And uh, he was driving so fast, he turned, his, 
He turned his uh, black jacket. He zipped it up in the back like the one you got on. He zipped it up in the back. He was cold, you know. He zipped it up in the back and he, and he put the back in the front. And, 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 and he had a wreck. And uh, the ambulance got there and uh, uh, they found a dead man along the road there. And, uh, and the doctor came and said, what's wrong? He said, well, we, we tried to straighten his head out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is, you know. People going around with their heads on backwards. They don't know where they're going, you know. You you got to go to the school of first lunatic and become a lunatic to be a politic. You got to be a lunatic. I'm not kidding. You got to be half crazy to, to govern. They had a guy here just recently. Got he's going to get executed. And uh, would you get this? I mean, listen to me. I hope some politicians listen to me right now. This guy's on trial. His name's Powell. He's supposed to be executed this week. He raped and murdered a girl. And then he raped and tried to murder her sister, cut her neck, but she didn't die. So they tried the guy. They couldn't put him on trial. Well, in the court, the, 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 the attorney and, and, and the Commonwealth attorney, I don't know who it was, uh, he says... That because they didn't have, they had sloppy uh, uh, police investigation, and uh, since he, he didn't have any intentions of raping her, we're just going to give him life. We're not going to give him the, the, uh, the death penalty. So Powell was exonerated of the death penalty. So he wrote a letter to the attorney general and said, "You stupid imbecile." <laughs> he said, "You're the stupidest guy in the world." That's what he called it. He said, I had every intention of raping that girl. Anybody that right by knows I had every intention of raping, uh, uh, raping that girl, except your court, and except you. And, and, he, and he wrote letters to her mom and her dad, saying, uh, I had fun raping your daughter, and I'm exonerated, and I can't be tried for the same uh, crime because they exonerated uh, me. And so he wrote letters to the, to the attorney, to the Commonwealth attorney. He wrote letters to the parents. He's going all through the cell block bragging about how he committed premeditated murder. And because the law was so screwed up, they, they didn't even know what they were doing. And finally, the Commonwealth attorney, he got all upset about it. And uh, he, he found a way to overturn the first sentence. And now they're going to execute him. He was so mad. But actually, the law was wrong both times. Because once you're exonerated, you can't try a man. A second time. So the criminal was right. So they are stupid. He's right. The criminal is right. The whole legal system is absolutely, consummately stupid. It says, we don't see things subject to man. Man's not in control anymore. The inmates are running the asylum. The criminal is running the judicial system. Reprobates are in the pulpit. Theologians are devils. They're diabologians. They're not theologians. They're devils. We don't see things subject to man. That's what it says here. But he says we do see something, verse 9. Now here's the lighter part of it. The word in verse 8 means to just look around and you don't see nothing. If you look around like that, you don't see nothing. But verse 9 said, but we do see. Are you with me? We don't see in verse 8. But in verse 9, we do see. And the word is blepo. The Greek word means look your eyes out. Focus. Look intently. Look. Gaze. See Jesus. And this old wicked, screwed up, messed up, topsy-turvy world, we see Jesus made for a little while lower than the angels, just like man. The suffering of death, crowned with glory, with honor. By the grace of God, He might taste death for everyone. Now, what death did Jesus taste for us? What death did He die for us? Did he just die a bloody death, a sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary? Well, no. It was more than that. I can die a death myself. I can die for myself. You can die for yourself. He didn't die a first death for you. He didn't die just a physical death in the hospital for you. 
When Jesus went to that cross, He was a propitiation, a covering of the wrath of God. He poured out all of His life. He died the death that you're going to die in hell. That's the second death. That's the death He died for you. The devil's hell. Not your physical death. Not the death when your body ceases. Not rigus morgan, uh, uh, mortis. He died the death that a person dies in hell. It says in verse 10, it was fitting for him. That word fitting means it, it behooved him. It became him. In other words, he knew that God had to be a just God. And God had to lay the sins of the world on Jesus. And justice is necessary to sustain God's existence. If God is not just, then God can't exist. God can't exist without Jesus. Jesus can't exist without God. Jesus harmonizes God's justice and God's love, God's mercy and God's law. Jesus stands between a hell-avenging God and a merciful uh, cry of a sinner. When Christ died, He not only died for man, He died for God to satisfy God's justice. Romans 3, verse 26. And what is said of God here in chapter 2, verse 10, is also said of Jesus. Because it says here uh, that... For Him and by Him all things are made. So, it was fitting for Him for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. This is God the Father. And God the Father made Jesus the captain, the prince, the prince, the son of the king. And it says, for whom all all things are made, and through whom all things are made. In other words, what is said of God in verse 10 is said of Jesus in Colossians 1, 16. All things were made for Jesus. They were made by Jesus. In Revelation 4, 11, it said all things were made for Jesus, and they were made by Jesus. And here it says all things were made for God the Father, and all things were made by God the Father. Anyone who does not believe that Jesus Christ is equal to God is never going to make it to heaven. There's no way they can make it to heaven. John said, if the love of the Son is not in you, the love of the Father is not in you. No one can come to the Father but through the Son. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. John made that so clear because some people want to have God the Father, but they don't want to have God the Son. No way. Don't even think about it. It's unthinkable, it's unimaginable to try to have God the Father without God the Son. All things were made for both of them, by both of them, and that Christ died for God on the cross. And if you want to come to God, you've got to come through Christ. And Christ is crowned. He wore the crown. And He bore the crown. It said, by the grace of God, it came seeking man, Titus 2.11, Titus 3.4. Just as a doctor samples the medicine in order for the patient to realize it won't hurt him. So Jesus Christ had the taste of death so that death would not hurt us. He took the worst medicine. He bore the worst punishment. He experienced the most excruciating pain. He inherited the kingdom as God. And He merited the kingdom as man. And that's why in John seventeen twenty six. Oh, man, what a Scripture this is. If you read this Scripture every day of your life and ask God to help you to put it into practice, you will see sweeping changes in your life. You will never be the same if you can just read John seventeen twenty six, And every day, say, God, help this to work its way into my spirit. I have made known Thy name to them, and will make it known that the love wherewith You did love me may be in them, and I in them. What he's saying is, what he's saying is, that every one of you people sitting here tonight, and every one of you listening to me, would love Jesus Christ the way that God loves Jesus Christ. If you love Jesus Christ the way that God loves Him, 
they're never going to be the same. If every day you pray, and all of your activities, and all of the demands of your life, and all of the challenges that you face, oh God, help me to love your son the way that you do, then that love is going to be perfected in you, and you're going to be victorious. He died. He tasted of death, not for the whole world, but for everyone. Notice in the singular. He tasted of death for every man, every person. So the evangelist is right when he says that Christ died for you as if you were the only person in the world. He tasted of death for the singular. If only one person in this room would say, Christ, you're mine, and I'm yours, then Christ was successful and given His life for you. Now all this great salvation goes all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to Adam, and it works its way all the way into the end of the world. That's why I have across the top of my chart God's great salvation. It was in the mind of God before the world began. It says here, and I believe that probably the most important verse that we're dealing with at this point uh, is uh, the verse here, 210. It was fitting for him. It behooved him. It became him. In other words, he's saying, God, I have to do this. Not for my sake, but for the sake of the world. You see, unbelief considers the cross a disgrace. But the propitious slaughter of the Lamb of God on the cross of Calvary was imperative. God's justice could never have been satisfied without the death of Christ. Now listen to me, my Muslim friends. Listen to me, my Mormon friends. Listen to me, my Jehovah Witness friends. Listen to me, my Seventh-day Adventist friends. Those of you people who have a low view of Jesus Christ, you don't believe He's equal to God. Listen to me. When you look up to heaven and see the throne of God, you're going to look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And you're going to see the Lamb of God before the throne of God. It talks about the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. They're together. Listen, my Muslim, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, my Christian scientist, my Seventh-day Adventist friends, listen to me. You pay close attention. When you look at the throne of God, you got to look through the Lamb, the bloody slaughtered Lamb. Don't you make fun of Jesus dying on the cross. How dare you say it was weak for God to allow His Son to die such a bloody death. What a spectacle. We don't want a God who dies on a cross. I'll tell you, it was absolutely necessary. It behooved Him. It became Him. It was as imperative as the justice of God for Christ to die. For it was the only way that God could show His love for you, you rascal, you reprobate, you lost sinner. That's the only way that God could ever show His love for you. And how dare you mock the death and despise the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. You're not going there unless you go through the Lamb of God. Nowhere. You're Antichrist. When you deny that the death of Christ was as necessary as the justice of God, it says that God laid upon Him the iniquity of us all. God bruised Him. God smote Him that the, that, that, that the justice of God might be completely satisfied and covered and propitiated by the slaughter of the Lamb. And that Lamb, that bloody Lamb, is still before the throne of God. You've got to go through the Lamb to get to God, brother. You've got to go through the Lamb to get to God. Because God's not going to accept you except in the Lamb. Behold the Lamb! Forty times in the book of Revelation it says the Lamb. You can't read the book of Revelation without seeing the Lamb up there. And that Lamb is the predestined plan of God. God always said in 2 Corinthians 5.20, all through the Old Testament, God was in Christ. Reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing to them their sins and their trespasses. God in Christ 
One arm of the cross reaches all the way back to Adam. The other arm of the cross reaches all the way out to the end of the world. And the head of the cross is God's predestined counsel that this is the only way. And that cross comes right down on the planet Earth and plants His place in the city of Jerusalem. There in that city on the apostles' doctrine. And those apostles, according to Luke 22, 29, who wrote this book of Hebrews and the rest of this New Testament are going to judge all of the old Testament people and judge all who are living today and are going to judge all who are yet to be born because Jesus said in John 20 12, He said, as the Father has sent me, He said to those apostles, so send I you. You are the executors of my kingdom. What you write is going to stand forever. And what is written in this book is all I have to go by. You have no other creed, no other book, no other confession of faith, no other catechism. There are no divine books. There are no revelations. There are no modern day prophets. This is it. It's final. God spoke through the Son, and the next time He speaks, it's going to be heaven or hell. That's it. It's final. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you don't have to wait for some prophet to come down the street and give you something else? Huh? Aren't you glad it's right here? It's settled. Whew! Man! We need apostolic preachers, apostolic potential, apostolic possibilities, apostolic teaching, apostolic foundation. We need preachers to get back to the old Jerusalem gospel, the old apostles' doctrine, just as it was once and for all delivered to the saints. Can I hear an amen? It affects many, not everybody. This covenant stuff's not for everybody. When Jesus gave the Lord's Supper, He said, This is the blood of my covenant shed for many. And this Jesus said, I'll proclaim thy name to my brethren. Verse 12. That's born again. The word brethren means from the same womb. I tell my children, I said, You better get along together. You came out of the same womb. How dare you not get along together? Whenever they'd have fights and spats, Jealous attacks. I say, look, there's your mom over there. And I point to her belly and I say, you all came out of the same womb. So you get along together. That's what brethren are, brethren. We're united, brethren. (laughs) Now, the womb is the water of baptism, literally. It's just like coming out of the womb of a woman. It's the circumcision of Christ. You're all born of the Spirit. Therefore, those of you who've come out of the same water of baptism, you need to be brethren. And it says here, Jesus said, I'll proclaim thy name to my brethren. Uh, In the midst of the congregation, I'll sing thy praise. You know who's the song leader in the the congregation? It doesn't talk about church. It talks about congregation. I I don't want a church building. I want a congregation, don't you? I don't like church buildings. I like congregations. I don't care how fancy your church is. You know that? Gee, I can't afford fancy church buildings. I can't afford fancy preaching. You know, Jesus has got a lot of poor folks doing His work. There's a lot of poor folks out there doing His work. They're all members of the congregation. It's a congregation. And again, I'll put my trust in Him. And behold! <laughs> he said, behold! <laughs> he said, I and the children whom God has given me. Who's leading singing here? Come on, who's, singing, who's leading this song? That's in the book of Psalms. David was a song leader. King David led the congregation. And I tell you who's leading the congregation when we lead singing next week? It's Jesus. I'm going to look past the song leader and I'm going to listen to Jesus. He said, Behold, Father, here's your children. You know, it says in Isaiah 9 6, he said that Jesus Christ is Almighty God, everlasting Father, right? Not only is God our Father, Jesus is our Father. How does He father us? He fathers us through the Word. He sanctifies us. Now the question is, are you sanctifying yourself? Or is Jesus sanctifying you? How many of you believe that Jesus is sanctifying you? Uh, How many of you believe that you're sanctifying yourself? You don't know. <laughs> He's the only guy who got it right. 
You got right, okay? The Bible speaks of be you holy, right? That your Father in heaven is holy. Again, it says in the book of Leviticus, God said, I make you holy. Now, you see, it takes both you and God to be sanctified. Get that. If it were just God, everybody would be sanctified, wouldn't it? If all that was responsible for sanctification, God, God then everybody would be sanctified. He, he just blanketed it on everybody. But, but Jesus said in the book of John 17, verse 10, He said, Sanctify them, Father. Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. You got that? Now, what is the word? What is the word He's talking about there? He said, I give them the word. What word did He give? What word did Jesus give us? The Old Testament or the New Testament? What word did Jesus give us? The old or new? Huh? Well, we just read here that the Old Testament was given by angels, and now God speaks through the Son, right? So in John 17, what did the apostles write? Did they write the law of Moses, or did they write the New Testament? Yeah, so we're talking about the New Testament. You can't get sanctified by reading the Old Testament. When Jesus says, sanctify them, John 17, 10, through the truth, thy word is truth. He said, I have given them thy word. Jesus didn't give the Old Testament. He gave the New Testament to us. All right, now here's the question. If you're going to be sanctified through the New Testament, that's what he said. You're not going to get some nebulous, ambiguous sanctification. It's just... We're not going to drop down out of the heavens. Uh, sanctification is something that has to be real. Something you can put your hands on. Therefore, if you're going to be sanctified, you've got to read the Word. You know a lot of people say, well, the Holy Spirit's in me. Is the Holy Spirit reading the Bible tonight? Or are you reading it? Does the Holy Spirit read the Bible for you? Uh, uh, you might as well just stay home next week. No, why come? Right? Well, I have a Bible. The Holy Spirit's going to read the I don't know of anybody that the Holy Spirit reads the Bible for. Jesus said, let him who has. <laughs> and you're not just reading, you're listening. You're hearing the Word of God. And if you don't read the... Uh, I remember I told you you're going to be holy and sanctified and filled with the Spirit. So, uh, when he says here uh, that both the sanctifier and those who are sanctified, verse 11, that's speaking of both actions. It's a covenant. God is sanctifying you. He's enabling you. He's filling you. But you have got to do your part and be attentive to the Word. Don't let it slip. That's where we started at. And then the congregation, uh, being with each other. You should get a, a real thrill out of being with other people. Uh, he's the captain of our faith. He's the prince of Daniel. Not Moses. He's like Joshua. Jesus. Ah. Uh, there's no uh, Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. John seven thirty nine. the Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. But the indwelling of the Holy Spirit came in John 7, verse 39. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. He was given. And in Psalms 22, I want to read this. i got about five minutes left. In Psalms 22, it talks about praising. And I love this here. Uh, uh, where did, uh, Jesus is praising God for us. Uh, And uh, you can't have Psalms 23 unless you have Psalms 22. Uh, Everybody wants Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, But you can't have the Lord is your shepherd unless you have Psalms 22, uh, the Lord as your propitious sacrifice. My God, why have you forsaken me? Psalms 22, 1. He has to die for the sheep to be your shepherd. So when you read Psalms 23, make sure you have the Savior of Psalms 22 before you have the shepherd of Psalms 23. And Psalms 22, he says in verse 22, I will tell of thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise thee. And you who fear the Lord, praise Him. So here's Jesus praising God for you. And you respond in verse 23 by praising God for Him. Does that make sense to you? Where's the praise at? Christ is praising God. He said, look at my children. Look how many people are born of the water and the Spirit. And and He said, Father, He said, I'm going to proclaim Your name. I'm going to call them my brethren. And they're going to call you Father. And when Jesus ascended, He said, I'm going to your Father and my Father. 
your God and my God. That was answered when He made us brethren. And we're all of the Father. And He's not ashamed to call you brethren. If you were a child of the devil, Jesus would be ashamed of you. But if you're one of the brethren of Christ, Jesus is bragging about you. And in verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise also partook of the same that through death. Just as Goliath had a great sword, and David fell him, and he took that sword from Goliath and cut Goliath's head off with his very sword that he tried to kill him with, so Jesus took the worst enemy we have, death, took the sword, and used that very sword of death to kill death, that he might render powerless him who had the power of death. We have no fear of death. Even as we grow old and feeble, if you're not a Christian, you ought to be scared to death of dying. If I wasn't a Christian, I'd be afraid to go to bed tonight. I'd say, Preacher D, take me down here, find a pool of water, and immerse me into Christ this very moment. I'm afraid of dying. I want to be around the Lord's table next Sunday because I'm afraid of dying. I want to be in the blood covenant because I'm afraid of dying. But if I have Him who destroyed death as my Savior, He entered corporal life of flesh and blood. He had to be a flesh and blood individual in order to shed blood because angels don't have blood in their body and they can't die for our sins. He had to have blood in His body. And Jesus then shed that blood of a human body. He overcame sin in a human body. The devil had the power of death. The devil had the power of temptation. The devil had the reign of death and terror. He's no plaything. I don't, I don't tell jokes about the devil. But Jesus Christ rendered him powerless by killing him with his own weapon, the power of death. And Christ is king of all. Even death is under his control. Unto us a son is given. Unto us a prince is given. In Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-two, it said he took them by the hand and he led them out of the bondage in, in Egypt. But he said, I will establish a new covenant with you, not according to the old. When I took them by the hand and led them. But he said, I will write my laws in your heart and in your minds. I will write them. This is a new covenant. I saw a man the other day with a little boy. and uh, No, it was a little girl. And it was so, so sweet. Uh, he was about six foot two. My big man, and he had that little girl by her dainty little hand, and they were walking down the street together. It was so tender. And I thought of this scripture here where he said, I will take them by the hand, and I will lead them through life. And here the great hand of God reaches down through Jesus Christ and takes your little hand. In this great world that we live in, he singles you out as an individual, and, and he takes not by the hand of angels. He didn't die in an angel's nature. He died in your, na- in your nature. He died a flesh and blood death. He partook. Uh, he's the nearest of kin. He is your Goel. Uh, he has to redeem you because He is your kinsman. He became your, not your cousin. He became your brother that He might take you by the hand. Not as a seed of Abraham, it says here in verse 16. Uh, and He reaches out and the word give help, help means to take by the hand that He might lead you to the promised land. You're being sanctified. Both God and the Father are your Father. And the Son is your Father. Uh, He was made the Son of God. Uh, And God makes sons of God out of sons of men because He made the Son of God the Son of Man. Christ exhibited undying trust as man. Not God. For man. And unto the day He died, he, he, he had to yield, not for himself, but for you. Uh, he put his trust in God unto the very end, so he could deliver you from death, deliver you from devil, and deliver you from sin. Therefore, uh, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, and he might become a, a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Uh, have mercy on me, O God. Be propitious to me, O God. He Himself was tempted, and that what He suffered, He's able to come to the aid of all of those who suffer. I I was writing this commentary in Ormond Beach, Florida. 
and uh, I, I happened to take a break from my typewriter, uh, my, my computer, and I went out into the hallway, and, and uh, there was an old woman bent over. Uh, she looked so feeble and so weary, and uh, she, was, uh, uh, she was a servantess. Uh, she was taking care of the garbage, and she had a job working with the hotel. And uh, I felt sorry for her. And I went over to her, and I said, how you doing? She said, I, I, I'm terrible. <laughs> I said, what's wrong? And she rattled off all the things she had from kidney problems to back problems. And, and I said, you're here working? Uh, you're a janitress? I said, uh, how in the world haven't you retired yet? She said, uh, I'm not old enough to have Social Security. I have to work just to pay my bills. She said, my husband died, and... She said, it's just all I can do to make it true a day. I tell you, she touched my heart. And I had just read this, chapter 2, verse 18, about a high priest and how that he died for every person, including that poor woman there. And I said, you mind if I pray for you? She said, no. She bowed her head, and I prayed for her. And then I said to her, you have a great high priest. She said, I do. I said, yeah, you have a great high priest. That's an evangelistic thought, buddy. Everyone in this world has a great high priest. You may not know it yet. You may have not owned him yet, but he died for everyone, didn't he? Did he die for that woman I'm talking to? And then I put my arm around her and I said, this high priest knows everything that you need. He knows every want that you have. He knows every dollar that you need to survive. He knows every ache and pain that you're enduring because he went through it all for you. And then I said, ma'am, I'm going to be here for four more days and I'm going to see you every day. And I'm going to pray for you. I didn't have much money in my pocket, but I did what I could. Every day she came back to that floor. And each day I saw a little bit more bright expression on her face. It was sad for me to leave because I'd hoped that I could have stayed there long enough to teach her the Word of God. But I put her in contact with another preacher, put her in contact with another congregation of people, and I hope that she follows it up. I got her name and address. But she said, I have a high priest. I said, yes, you do. She said, he's on the throne. I said, yeah, he's there for you. And every day she came back for the next four days before I left. And she said, you know, things are going better for me. And I said, you're not even a Christian yet, honey. Just entertaining the thought that you have a high priest is giving you such motivation and giving you such promise that things are working out. Can you imagine what it's going to be like if you really get the real thing? I said, I hope, sweetheart, that when I come down here next year, you're still working here and that you have a better income and a better life and better health because your high priest is going to help you. Amen? Amen. Thanks for listening. It's been good being with you all. I love you all. Right on time. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Oh, man. Thank you for your work. I yeah. appreciate it. Really, that's, that's hard work. That Hebrew, hard work. That Hebrew's too is loaded, isn't it? Wow. I didn't think it was. Yeah, it's loaded. Yeah. I was like two hours solid. Yeah. Well, three and four is going to get even better. Yeah. 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 And, and I'll tell you what, where do we get to the blood of Christ speaking from heaven? You want to hear something. The blood of Christ is talking. You think you'd have time to pray for me? Yeah. Four of them. Yeah. Just for his will be done. Right, right, right. Okay, now, fill me in one more time. All right, well, I've got a. I can retire. Full, full retirement at 60. Okay. I'm 57 in June, June 1st. Okay. All right. Uh, they came out with a kind of a buyout package. Okay. It's not mandatory. Okay. They're giving you 18 months. They're paying you for 18 months if you go ahead and take the package. Plus, I've got two different options. I can go on my retirement. Uh, They're going to give you a lump sum? Uh, either that or monthly installments. Um, Which is better, right? Uh, probably for me. That's the way I look at it. 
It, they pay me my full my full pay for eighteen months. I'm gonna okay. be there. Okay. Plus, I'll get my retirement at that time. Okay. Okay. During that time. Okay. Uh, and there's like maybe one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Also, that's extra to buy you out. And I don't I don't lose anything other than I lose eighteen percent of my full retirement because I'm fifty-seven instead of at sixty. I, that's eighteen percent less. So you, you'll be receiving. <coughs> Well, I've got two options. I can receive more until I'm 62, and then I get less. I love you guys. Love you too. I love you. It was good tonight. Thank you, sweetheart. Love you all. And then, at, and then at 62, I get less money if I get more at 57. But I can take less money at 57 and get more at 62. Okay. So, uh, and then you'll get your full price pension. You get a pension from your company. When does it come in? Uh, starts. As soon as I retire, it's going to be eighteen percent less. So, and that will kick in. Bye bye. That will kick in at sixty-two. No, that's Social Security kicking at sixty-two plus my plus my pension from them. So they end up being roughly four thousand dollars a month at sixty-two. What both pensions? And plus I have a a, a savings plan, probably one hundred fifty thousand dollars in that. Okay. Roughly. Which I can get out. You, you can take it out if you want, but you don't have to. I don't have to, no, sir. So you have the savings plan. You'll have the 125000 severance pay. The four taxes. Huh? The four taxes on that. Oh, you don't have to pay taxes I on do it. have to pay taxes. Oh, okay, okay. And then... Uh, so that'd be $90,000 <clears> roughly. Okay, 90000 pay buyout. Then 18 months of full pay. How, how long do you have to prepare? How long do you have to? I can do this by Friday. You have to know by Friday? Yes, sir. And you've got Chuck and John and others playing for you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me think on this for a minute. Sure. <laughs> Tally ho! Bless you. you. Have a great, great evening. <laughs> Wasn't it good to have her? Uh, <clears throat> she brightened this place up tonight. Yes, she did. She sure did. <laughs> She's got I wasn't out. talking about her tonight, but that dad about was I? Oh, she'll look you in the eye. She's focused. Yeah, she well, she, I don't, does. she gets good grades. Look at her. Look she at her. Looks at her. She looks you in the eye. Is that right? She's looking right now. <laughs> I love you guys. God bless. Okay. Do you tell Kathy bye? Sorry. Okay. What's that for? That's for her. From Cindy. Yeah, okay. For the class. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. She wrote out to Christian Kingdom College. Okay. No problem. She wrote out to yeah, no problem. Let me, and there's money for the books up in that. Okay, okay. Yeah. She's a sweet girl. Bless her. Thank you, dear. Thank you. You guys are fabulous. <laughs> fabulous. Don't we look alike? Fabulous. I love you guys. Oh, I love you. Too. Oh, it's been great, man. This has been great. Yeah. Don't get any better than this. I yeah, love we'll have a, we had a lot of people today, didn't you we? You had a great, great evening. Everybody's happy. Don't forget your strawberries. Uh, Where's your stuff? Uh, okay. Put them, put them, put them in my that box over there. <laughs> and uh, I should have had you do that when I was teaching. You, um, oh, it's okay. Do you need me to get you a drink of water? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's one uh, yeah, there. yeah, I need that bad. I'm, I'm dying of thirst. Gatorade. Go get the Gatorade. I got, you want Gatorade? Uh, where you get it at? Oh, we have it with we, us. We brought it. We brought it. Yeah, if you have some, I'll take some. Yeah, okay, please. A any kind, whatever you pick. Whatever you pick. Well, oh, man. I love you, honey. I bless you. Thank you. Are you exhausted? No, really not. I I I feel pretty good. Uh, I just wanted to sit down. My foot's been hurting. These shoes are too tight for me. Oh, well, that's so fun. Yeah, they're hurting me. I, I, I shouldn't have bought them. Yeah. I tried to stretch them. I put a, a, a bar in them to stretch them, and they worked for a while. But, 
Thank you. Give him a massage now. Where are you going? Here, does she going to give you a massage? No, I need it, ma'am. If you were laying on a mat, I could give you a chiropractor. Can you get a free Thank you so much, brother, for coming. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, so you got one more year left, right? My prayers will be going up for you. Uh, I'm going to be praying hard for you, brother. Uh, you, you've got a great influence for Jesus. Just look at these guys. Like, uh, I, I know he wasn't that good of a role model, but... Uh, he was always talking about Jesus and uh, Evander Holyfield. Uh, they had a great example uh, for the Lord. I'll tell you, another guy that was preaching all the time was the guy that, uh, he died, but he was a uh, defensive end. Yeah, oh, what a man he was, yeah. Yeah. And the Green Bay Packer, uh, yeah, White, Reggie White. Oh, man. And... Uh, we'll, 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 my days go back to boxing, and I was able to do a lot of work by teaching. I did exhibitions and preached the gospel when I was young. So uh, it's amazing the number of people that you've touched through sports. And, uh, uh, you'd be a good basketball player. Uh, <laughs> you like to play basketball? I used to. Yeah. Now I'm all broken down. Did you break it? I said, no, I'm all broken down now. Oh, oh, I thought maybe you broke around. Well, but they play basketball here every, uh, when do they play basketball? Uh, every Tuesday? Ian, oh, they are guys? Yeah. Are you kidding? He's going to kill everybody there. <laughs> they play every Monday? Well, they play um, every Sunday. They yeah. go and play. Yeah. yeah. If you want to go work out with our guys, they play in the armory. Okay. Yeah, it's just to pick up games, you know. They needed you last night. Or last night they played. Last time we lost. They needed you. That's true. Yeah. But they just played. So, but yeah, you're welcome to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to hurt you financially to take it. Uh, I can survive that. Uh, what, what percentage are you talking about over the next? See, the thirty years. The next thirty years. Yeah. Uh, after 62, I'll, I'll draw $4,000 a month. That's no, but, but you're going to have savings. Yeah. But, but I'm looking for monthly. Your monthly. Right now, I'm $5,500 a month. 65. 55 to 60. So you're going to, you're going to lose 1500 a month. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It may be more than that. But yeah, well, yeah, 1500 for sure. Yeah. Well, for the first five years, it'll be more because I'm gonna, I was going to take less and wait till I was 62. The Lord willing, I live that long, then pick up another $1,200 at, at 62, where I'm thinking I would need. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong. Maybe I need more money to. You're but with that 1500 is that take into consideration the Social Security and everything, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, brother. Good seeing you all again. How's you all? I've been going, man, with you, man. Very, very much. These guys, these guys are intense. They're very intense. They, 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 the whole evening they were intense. They didn't miss anything. I was watching you over there. Thank you all. That helps, uh, that helps me. It was. It all Okay, brother. Bye, bye, sweetheart. Yeah. And uh, it, it's it, it's a it's a good sign that that you're going to succeed because you have that concentration. Uh, and you're you're welcome to come here every time we meet. You're welcome to come here. I want you to know that. Appreciate it. Yeah, and if you don't have a book, get one. I mean, it's my gift from me. I'll get you. What you need a book? I'll get you one. No, I'm good. Okay, you got one. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, you're welcome here every time we're here. We have. We're going to be here eight more weeks. Okay. And uh, if you come to, if, if, yeah, if you if if you go through the whole eight weeks for, with me, and I will tell you what, if you want to just take those questions. And 